Well, thank you all very much for coming. Can you hear me clearly at the back? Yes. Uh, I'm hoping this can really be an opportunity more for a conversation than a lecture. So I'm going to talk a little bit, and then I hope we can open up to questions and try to direct this uh, in whichever directions you wish to go. I apologize if I seem, as usual, a little bit uh, brain dead. I, I think I have crossed the Atlantic uh, some, I think, three times in about the last week. And I'm flying tomorrow to London and then the day after to New York. So my scheduling is not very, uh, not, not very good. Um, I am delighted to be here. It's a great honor to be here. I've had a, a fascinating uh, glimpse uh, in the few minutes that I've been in the museum of, of the work of the museum. It's a great privilege to be associated uh, with this exhibition, which, as Michael said, any of you who haven't seen, please do see. Great privilege for a number of reasons. I mean, one of them is it's a very beautifully curated exhibition, um, and Fred is here who's curated it. Um, but also in the audience, we have um, Mr. Umar Sultan, who was the Deputy Minister of Culture, who helped to arrange the movement of this exhibition. It's, of course, an exhibition of, of Afghan art. This has come from the National Collection, the Museum of Afghanistan. And a great first step from Afghanistan, beginning to participate fully with a very precious collection uh, in the world. I, however, today am going to focus not on the collection, but more on some of the issues of contemporary politics and contemporary development in Afghanistan. This, of course, is topical. President-elect Obama has put a very strong emphasis on Afghanistan during the campaign, as you would have seen in the presidential debates. And the decisions of the United States in relationship to Afghanistan are going to be central to the development of Afghanistan over the next 20 years. So I want to begin just by a few observations drawn from my walk across the country of some of the problems, some of the challenges, some perhaps even of the cliches of work in Afghanistan, then talk a little bit about the international community and the ways in which the United States and its allies are trying to approach the problems in Afghanistan, and finally talk a little bit about some of our work in the old city of Kabul. Here, just to tease you, is an example of one of the documents produced by the international community. I say to tease you because of three and a half billion dollars of international aid spent in Afghanistan last year, 1.3 billion dollars was spent on consultants. So one of the major challenges in working out how to address Afghanistan, how to deal with Afghanistan, is what to do with this amazing army of foreign consultants and the paperwork that they produce. Here is another kind of image. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the negative stereotypes of Afghanistan, the way that it's perceived or described in the media, and then talk about what I see as many of the very positive elements, some of the reasons to be hopeful. So here, in terms of negative stereotypes, is an image taken from the very beginning uh, of my walk. I'm looking a little bit perplexed in this photograph because the man sitting immediately to my left as you look at the screen, carrying a paper and pencil in his hand, has just tried to shoot me. Uh, this man is uh, Mullah Mustafa. Where this is a photograph taken outside a town called Obe in central Afghanistan. I was too uh, frightened on this occasion to ask him why he was trying to shoot me. He explained later, when I saw him about 18 months later, that Nadir Shah, who's the man sitting immediately on his left, had bet him that he couldn't hit me. Uh, Mullah Mustafa has been in jail twice. He's been released from jail twice and is a very dominant figure in that part of Afghanistan. Why do I begin with him? Well, I think I begin with him because central to a lot of the problems which are being faced in Afghanistan at the moment are, of course, problems of security. And this is not just a question of dealing with the Taliban, which is what we hear about a lot in the media, but also simply dealing with criminal groups and gangs. People like Mullah Mustafa, who's not associated with the Taliban, in fact, was an anti-Taliban fighter. Or the recent incidents that you may have read about in Kabul of kidnappings, which again seem to be associated with criminal groups. Uh, 
and often criminal groups not from areas which are traditionally sympathetic to the Taliban. Here's the second image. This, of course, is another problem in Afghanistan. On the back of these donkeys is Afghanistan's main economic advantage, main comparative or competitive advantage at the moment. This is, of course, a photograph of poppies on their way to the market. Afghanistan currently produces approximately 93% of the world's heroin and still receives about $4 billion a year in international aid. Clearly, that trade is very difficult. It means that about $4 billion a year of money derived from poppy is flowing around in the country. This provides both support to criminal groups, but also, of course, corrupts many parts of the administration itself, because in order to get your donkeys out of, out of this place, these donkeys are going down the Harirud River, you need to pay policemen, you need to pay governors, you need to pay customs officials, and all this money finds its way in unexpected fashions back even to Kabul, where, for example, it's driving a property boom at the moment. Political power. Here's a, an image of a friend of mine carrying a walking stick. Uh, this is a man called Commandant Mualim Haji Mohsin Khan Kamenji. And he's standing here in front of one of his guest rooms. And outside the photograph is his private mosque, two lavatories, two tube wells dug by international aid agencies. He lives at this point, this was about a six and a half days walk from the nearest road. And his ancestors were described by the Anglo-Russian Boundary Commission in 1884. He's a very major tribal chief in central Afghanistan. He's a hereditary chief of the Taimani Aymak. Why am I putting him on the board? I'm putting him on the board because he, again, represents some of the challenges of political power in central Afghanistan. This was a man who was an official under the king in 72, and when the king was toppled by his cousin, became an official under the king's cousin in 73. When the king's cousin, in turn, was assassinated in a coup d'etat in 78, he became an official under the successor to the king's cousin. When the king's cousin's successor was, in turn, killed by his successor in 79, he was an official again, and this continued through to 1986. So this man remained a senior government official, 72, 73, 78, 79, 1980, right the way through to the Russian communist invasion, and then joined the Jamiat militia fighting in the resistance against the Russians in the late 1980s. And then at the time at which I met him, he had just been a Taliban commander. He was in hiding because he just tried to shoot Ismail Khan, who was then the governor of Herat. But he's now back in power again. He's a member of parliament, and he's the education director of the local district of Shahrak. So I'm putting him up on the board because he represents another challenge, which is there's been a lot of constitutional change, there's been a lot of elections, but this man, Haji Mohsen Han, seems to remain in power almost regardless.